Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Last talk, last session. I really appreciate you being here. Um, today, I want to talk about cloud-native Go Dev environments, um, especially the one that we've been using uh, at Typefox, which is the, uh, the startup I work at. And Typefox may be known for uh, creating Eclipse Thea. Eclipse Thea is a next generation IDE platform. It has nothing to do with the Eclipse IDE from days, uh, days gone by. Uh, it's built on, on web technology, runs on the desktop, runs on the web, uh, and has been adopted by companies like Google, Arm, IBM, Red Hat. Um, and on top of Thea, we built a software as a service product called Gitpod. And Gitpod runs on Kubernetes. And we have loads of Go in there. And today, I want to talk about the development environment that um, we built over time to develop Gitpod. So um, to get, give you an idea for, of the scope of this project that we're developing here, uh, it's about 15 services um, deployed across three regions, a bit over 100,000 lines of code, uh, and is used for about 25,000 hours per week. So it, it's not a hobby project. It's not Kubernetes either. So Gitpod itself is built, uh, as said, on top of Kubernetes. We deploy it to uh, Google, con uh, Google Container Engine. Um, there's a lot of containers involved, obviously. Most of the services are written uh, in Go. I mean, this is a Go conference. But we also do have uh, Node backend services. Our front end is, uh, is React, all written in TypeScript. And then there is a whole load of gRPC and RabbitMQ in there to tie it all together. Right. So this is, it's not the most complicated stack, but it's got some tools in there. And so when we started out, what we did is we did all of that on our machines, as you would. Right. So all the tools would be installed on our laptops. Uh, we would have Minikube that uh, we would deploy all those services to. And this setup is really hot stuff, quite literally. I mean, our laptops became so hot, uh, you know, you could warm coffee on that. Uh, my 16 gig machine would do nothing but run this setup. Right. So this very quickly became unscalable. This doesn't really work, especially not if you, if you want to work um, somewhere where you might not have access to power, for example. Your battery is going to be dead within an hour or so. So what we ended up doing is um, we created uh, automated preview environments. And this has several benefits. For one, it would move our development environments closer to our production environments. In order to make this stuff run on Minikube, we'd have to make quite a few modifications for it to work. Whereas here, what we would do is whenever someone would push a change to the repository, uh, or if you wanted to start with something new, you would create a branch, which is also a push. Uh, that, in turn, would deploy a new preview environment, uh, which you could then work with. So let me show you that really quick. So this is my IDE. And if I don't type wrong, in here I have all my, all my pods deployed. And this runs on, um, this runs on, on GKE, right? This doesn't run on, on my local machine. And all of this happened um, This is one of those Macs with a broken keyboard, so please bear with me. Uh, and all of this happened is because my last CI job just deployed all of this. Right? So when I did my last push to this branch, everything was, um, was deployed, and I have, have an environment that I can work with. Now, you might ask, how do I debug in this? Right? I mean, everything is, is removed now. How do, I, how do I actually work with this? It's nice. I can try my stuff. But um, I still need to debug. So on one hand, we have our preview, uh, preview environment, our Kubernetes world. And on the other hand, we have our local machine. So what we do is we start the service we want to debug. In our example, something that we call the Workspace Manager, um, a Go component that talks to Kubernetes, uh, maybe together with Delve so that we can debug this. And then there is a CNCF project called Telepresence. Who of you knows, has heard of Telepresence before? That's a decent, decent amount. So what Telepresence does is it proxies um, a Kubernetes deployment to my machine and vice versa. So basically, to their process that I start with Telepresence, it feels as, feels as if it were running in a container. It gets the same environment variables. It gets 
similar file system, um, and all the, the network traffic is proxied in both directions. So let me show that briefly. So if I go into this component and say I want to put a breakpoint here and debug this, right? And the O is broken. This is really annoying. All right, so this is running at the moment in, in my cluster. And so if I start telepresence here, what happens is that telepresence is terminating the original deployment and is starting a new one. And this new one is basically a proxy um, in which my, uh, my process is being started. And in here, this process is basically Delph um, with Workspace Manager. Right. So this is all running now, so I can attach a debugger to it. And once the debugger connects, I can step through this. And note that the process that I'm debugging here right now is running in my, in my local dev environment, but it, to the process itself, it feels as if it were part of the container, right? So it has access to all the secrets, to all the mounts, to all the environment variables. I don't have to replicate that locally. And this is not exactly as if it were containerized, but it's close enough. It really works for 90% of the cases. So this is how uh, we have preview environments that are closer to production that do not burden our local machines and that still enable us debugging. Now, the problem with deploying those automated preview environments is that it was reasonably slow. And the big chunk of, of that time was because of the build. So when we started out, what happened is we would rebuild everything all the time. So even if you just changed a typo in one component, we would rebuild all the others. And the vast majority of this time was Jan downloading the internet. But still, um, there was, uh, it was too slow, actually. And what, what would happen is we would start interleaving individual tasks just to make use of that time that we'd spend waiting for. And this is really quite frustrating, actually. The way to solve that is we move to a caching build system. There are a few to choose from, Basil, Gradle. Um, we rolled our own in about 1,000 lines of Go code. Um, and with this, we brought the build time down to, on average, two minutes. Right? This is caching, so it really depends on the change you're making. If you're changing something really at the beginning of the dependency graph, then you have to build everything that comes after, and then you're back to full build times, which in this case is now 11 minutes, because we can utilize parallelism. But um, on average, we take two minutes in a no-op case where we really just want to redeploy. We're down to about 30 seconds. So to give you a quick impression of how that looks like, if I look at the, the packages, all the components basically that I have, um, let me make that a bit bigger. These are all the components that, that I have in my workspace that constitute this project. And again, if I look at Workspace Manager, and look at that one, then I can see that it knows all the source code that constitutes this component. And actually, the version of this component is built uh, through content hashes over the source code and its dependencies. In this way, if anything in the code or in its downstream dependencies change, uh, the project will get a new version and will be rebuilt. And we, use, uh, we just use um, GCP buckets as, as cache, and that works really well. The other problem was that as CI system, we use Jenkins, and nothing wrong with Jenkins. It's just that sometimes the Kubernetes executor took an awful long time to get things started, up to four minutes, really. And there were two problems with that. For one, the Kubernetes executor itself was really slow because it had artificial delays which were removed in a recent version. But also, after the, uh, the container is started in which the agent will execute, it still needs to reconnect back to, uh, to Jenkins in order to start. And before, four minutes didn't really matter so much because our builds were so slow, you wouldn't even notice. 
But now that builds take 30 seconds to two minutes, this really becomes a problem. What we did to, to solve that is we switched to a Kubernetes native CI system, uh, which in turn brought startup time down to about five seconds. So to quickly show that, this is the CI system. That's the last build that, that I ran. So if I restart that, here we are. My job is running. It's already cloning stuff. Right? And what happened in the background is that here it started my, my build job, which there, uh, which, uh, which is just a Kubernetes pod. All right, so you can think of this as, depending on how buzzwordy you want to get, serverless CI or whatever. But it's basically really just um, starting Kubernetes pods, and it does that near instantly. All right, so now we have really fast dev environments that, that offers good turnarounds and debuggability. What we still need to do, though, is we still need to set up our local dev environment. And this stack has, a lo has loads of tools which are a pain to set up in the first place. Problem is, this is not a one-time operation. It's not like you're setting them up once, and then you're good to go forever. But in reality, you have to maintain a certain version window, and you have to maintain that across the team. Right? So everyone in the team has to use at least similar versions. And if you want to go back to a state of your product from two months ago, because you need to fix something for a client that has an outdated version, you're stuck with the same problem again. You'll have to go back all those to the particular versions of the tools that were used at the time. And we have already solved this problem, right? Our CI builds have exactly the same issue. And what they do, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. This is <laughs> probably the best way to capture the sentiment. Uh, right? Setting up those environments is quite painful, really. So our CI systems have already solved this problem. And the way they do that is we containerize things. We put our tools into, into Docker containers. Yesterday, there, there was a uh, talk on this, uh, in this room about GoFuzz. And the presenter, when doing a demo, just spun up a Docker container and did their stuff in there. And so you know, this is, is quite a usual concept, except that until now, we weren't able to use that for the IDE proper, because uh, you know, you're, you're removing yourself from your local environment where your IDE runs in, unless you do have an IDE that runs in the cloud too, right? Unless you have an IDE that runs um, as a container as well, which is shameless plug what Gitpod does. So the IDE that I've been using here, as you might have noticed, is running in my browser. And the user land that I have in here, so for example, the fact that I have Proto C available, I have because this is in my Docker file that defines Proto C, uh, or defines how this is to be installed. And so every, every one of, uh, everyone in the team who works on this repository gets the same tools without having to set them up. Now, say I want to work on a new feature. Um, I have an issue. Um, that I want to work on. So what I'll do is I'll fire up my IDE, I'll check out my code, or in case of Gitpod, have it checked out for me. And then I still need to build everything, right? I still need to run go get, um, download dependencies. We have Athens in the loop, so we use a go proxy, which not only makes things more stable, but also faster. I still have to wait for it, though. Um, th and Node is, uh, is even worse. If I want to download all the Node dependencies, this takes a good time. So in our case, this, this took about 15 minutes. Um, and you have to do that for each checkout, for each issue, for everything you want to start working on. And just as a back of the envelope uh, calculation, if you do that four times a day, which is not unlikely, and you have 10 people in your team, you have one person in your team just sitting there watching paint dry. Right? All they do is watch code compile. Um, and Here's something that we can do. Now that we have an IDE that runs, uh, runs in the cloud that is always on, so to speak, we could reuse what we already do with CI, where if someone pushes a change to our repository, we start building our code, testing our code, deploying our code. We could do the same thing for an IDE. And this is exactly what we're doing. So if someone pushes a change to the repository, um, our IDE already starts downloading everything, pre-building everything. And when you open the IDE, everything is ready for you. 
Right, this is what I'm, I'm always quite happy when I see that little banana telling me that, all right, I don't have to get a coffee now. So to sum everything up, what we've done here is, for one, we've moved our development environment from our local machines into a Kubernetes cluster, our preview environments. We can debug in there using Helm, we, uh, using Telepresence, sorry. We deploy using Helm, much like we would for production or our staging environments. And then we use uh, an open source IDE, Thea, or its hosted version, one of its hosted versions, Gitpod, to, um, to work with it. And one thing that's really key here is that all those definitions that make up our deployment, that make up our development environment, everything is as code. Right, we've basically replaced a long readme that details how you have to install your tools with something machine readable and something machine executable. So rather than making the new guy in your team go through that outdated readme, um, they now click a button on, on, Git, uh, on Git, uh, GitHub. Sorry. So there's a browser extension. Uh, if you click that, uh, it starts an IDE for you based on, on that context. Right? And this is all, all someone has to do. I already have one. So everything lives as code and evolves together with our development environment, uh, with our code, sorry. So if I decide that we got a bump go to 114 because I want those fast defers, it's one change and then everyone else gets it. All right, that's it, short and sweet. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? You showed the uh, brother extension to have the GitPub button, but I didn't really understand how it connects to your ah. environment. Yeah, so what it does is um, for this button, I have the, uh, I've configured where my GitPub installation lives, or I can use the, the service that, that we host. And once you click that, it opens a, uh, you can actually see it down here. I'll put it in there. You can, you can open a URL, which is basically your GitHub URL prefixed with gitpod.io hash. And then based on that, it's going to understand what you want to open. And in the repository, we have um, a .gitpod.yaml, which um, describes, uh, among other things, all the tasks I want to start and things I want to execute. But most importantly here, it describes a, a Docker file. And this is my, my user land that it starts then. All right, so the connection between that button and my IDE is really this URL from which we pass the context. Thanks. So I missed the first minutes. Maybe you talked about it. But if I want to use some CI tool just for convenience or whatever, and it's not inside this environment, what would I do? So this environment, the environment as a whole that I described is independent of any CI tool, right? This is really a collection of different tools that we plug together to make them work for us. And we used to use Jenkins as CI, now we use Valve, but you might as well use um, Travis or Circle CI. Um, this is completely independent of the IDE that, that you use to work with this. Right, you could also use VS Code, then you're back to installing everything locally, or you can use something online um, like Gitpod. But this is independent of the CI system you want to use. The one that I showed, Velft, um, just has the handy benefit of having good uh, CLI integration, which not only makes for good demos, but it's also really handy, actually. So um, for example, if I want to just see what happens with, my la with the last job, uh, I can just open that in here without having to you know, browse some UI and find my branch. Right. Someone else did a countdown last time. I found that good. So five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. <laughs>